What's going on, everybody? My name is Tech, and you are tuned in to episode number two of the Reseller Greatness podcast. Sometimes it will be with me only. Sometimes I will be talking to a guest or several guests. If you did not see the first episode of the podcast, I interviewed Hanley, who's been in the group for a couple of years. She is a used car part reseller, and she also sells some new car parts. She's based out of Scotland. She has a very interesting story. And she has come a very long way. There was times when Hanley was really ready to throw in the towel and give up, close down business, because she has experienced a lot of problems that just about every single reseller experiences. And some of them are growing pains. Some of them are bad decisions. Um, But for the most part, we all go through them. So she's gone all the way to the point of all about giving giving up, ending it, and now is running a beautiful business. Her bank account is going up. She's selling a lot of items, and they just moved into a larger warehouse space where they can continue their improvement and continue to succeed inside of their business. So I could not be more proud and happier for Hanley. She has come a very long way. Um, we have spent a lot of time talking and all the different calls Um, much like Isaiah in the group, Hanley asks great questions and she challenges me with these questions to give better advice. So she makes me better doing my job and hopefully that rubs off on everybody else in the group because those conversations as a whole are great for the group in total and prove valuable learning lessons for everybody that is involved. So You know, speaking of the group, the group is doing great. I could not be happier or more pleased with the direction that the group is going. Everybody is making improvements. We are setting 52 goals and we are succeeding 52 times this year. And if we succeed 52 times, we will be in a beautiful position come this time next year. And for all the folks that have been with me for a year, you know, they look back at last year and they don't, you don't notice it. Until you look back at last year and you see how much you're up year over year. And, you know, I'm just so proud of those people and, you know, so proud of everybody for accomplishing all the goals that we are setting out and working on. So in our short time, we've already discussed metrics. We've defined our metrics. We've set rules for our businesses. We do, you know, our goals and accountability. We had time audits. We've discussed, is it easier to increase your average sale price slash profit, or is it easier to increase your productivity slash output? And that is a very, very good thought exercise. So, you know, is it easier to increase your profit 30% or be 30% more productive? And there's no right or wrong answer to that question. And that that answer is going to be different for everybody, depending on what stage of the game they're in what their obligations are, um, what they want out of eBay. And the beautiful thing about eBay is that it's never one size fits all. Everybody is free to run their business how they see fit. And, you know, if you truly take advantage of the opportunity of eBay, it can, you know, totally change your life in the way that it has for, for me and my family. So, you know, for those folks that, you know, don't really know my background, because this is a new podcast and all of that stuff. So, you know, I'm about to be 40. I've been selling on eBay for over 15 years. Um, For a large portion of that time, I was the number one pre-owned men's clothing seller on eBay in every single category. Shirts, sweaters, jackets, pants, shorts, NCAA, NFL, NBA, NHL, you name it. I was the number one seller in all of those categories. At the peak of my eBay business, I had 53,000 items. And I've done every single model from very large warehouse to employees, number one store in the entire world in my categories, all the way to when I started where I was a single dad and I was renting a bedroom and my inventory process was pile in the corner. So no matter what step of the game you are in, We have something in common because I was there too once upon a time. I've done pile in the corner inventory system. 
I've done reselling as a single parent. I've done a little bit more organized in my bedroom that I was renting. I've done bins in my bedroom. I've done takes over my entire bedroom. I've done get a little storage unit, get another storage unit, get another storage unit. And then I had a bright idea to save up my eBay money and then put a down payment on a duplex. So that way I can get paid to store my items, which is great in theory and worked for a good amount of time until I then outgrew that side of the duplex. So then I had to you know, rent out both of the units and that still does great. And then I had the bright idea to buy a really big house and store all of my eBay inventory here so that way I don't have to pay for storage. That worked great for about a year. And then I outgrew this. So now I have just a really big house that as you can see is just empty. So after that, I moved into a 1200 square foot warehouse, which worked great. I think I was over there for, I think two years. And then I needed a bigger space. And then I moved into about a 2,500 to 3,000 square foot warehouse. I was rocking and rolling, making good money all along the way, really. Um, Because I was also investing in other businesses, starting other businesses. I have a lawn service, a tree service, a couple other things that I started all with eBay money. So reselling in eBay has afforded me all of the opportunities that I have in my life. And I am forever and truly thankful for the opportunities that we do have, you know, in this time, in this day and age. So after I got the 3000 square foot warehouse, um, the week or two before everything shut down a couple of years ago, um, the person directly next door to me in their warehouse, they moved out. Um, the owner of the warehouse asked if I wanted it. And I said, of course, I'll take it. And, um, now I got into around 6,000 square feet. Uh, and since my warehouse space doubled, I doubled my listing goal from 120 every single day that I used to do myself, photograph and listing every single day, seven days a week on a thrift route that was between 45 and 50 stores per week. And I used to go to the flea market three days a week on Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday and then on Saturday and Sunday, I used to go to the flea market two times a day. And I ran that operation, 120 items a day, for a long time. It was very long days. It's outside of my family obligations. My son and my wife, eBay consumed just about every second of my waking hour. And I was, you know, sleeping two or three hours per night. And this is all documented in the Facebook group where I would make a post going to sleep at 2 a.m. And I would wake up at four o'clock the next morning. And I did this for years. And even until this day, I am accustomed to not sleeping so much. I mean, now I'm really living in the lap of luxury and I get probably three or four hours a night, but I'm fine. I can operate that way. My level remains high. Um, I have no problem with a very small portion of sleep, which, you know, most people, um, you know, it's not the same for everybody. So, you know, everybody is different. Everybody has different needs. Um, but for whatever reason, I can still operate all gas, no brakes for 20 hours a day, um, still be sharp um, and still get everything done, everything completed. So I did that for a really long time, 120 items a day by myself, thrifting 45, 50 stores a week and going to the flea market three days a week, five, three, five times at the flea market total per week. Um, but it was an absolute grind, absolute grind. But during that time, you know, we moved out of not such a great neighborhood to into a good neighborhood. My son was scheduled to go to a very bad high school. Then he went to a very great high school. Um, during that time, a lot of things changed for, for me and my family. I started new businesses. Those businesses began to flourish. Um, and because of those other businesses and those other obligations and my son, my wife and everything else that I had to do, unfortunately, I was the one that got the loose end of the stick. So 
what I had to give up during that time was ultimately um, a good night, eight hour sleep. So am I thankful that I did it? Absolutely. Would I ever go back and redo it? Never in a million years. So once the shutdown hit and I was doubled my warehouse space, I went to 140 items a day for a short amount of time. That was okay. And then I went to 160 items a day for a short amount of time. And during the 160 phase, I started exploring my options of having people help source for me. So I met a couple of people from the flea market and they would bring me 30 pieces, 50 pieces. And I made these smaller buys because it was stretch. It was hard for me to get anything past 120, 140 per day. It was very difficult to do. Um, because these pieces needed to meet my metric. I'm just not going to list bad items for the sake of listing bad items. So, you know, during that time, I did start to kind of network. And prior to that, I was an absolute lone wolf. I didn't talk to anybody. I was not active on social media. Um, I was just out to do my job and do my job to the best of my ability. So I started to network with people at the post or at the flea market. And they would bring me inventory. Um, and then every, everything changed. Everything changed around March 19th of 2020. And we all know what happened at that time. Um, the NBA shut down. The NHL shut down. And everything changed. I had just hired um, my first employee to help me list at that time. And everything shut down. So since my warehouse had doubled, I wanted to double the listing goal now that I did bring on an employee. And that's when I went from 120 to 250 a day. And the world was very uncertain. There was two weeks to flatten the curve. We all know that lasted much longer. So everything was closed and I had to pivot. And that is going to be the underlying message of this podcast is pivoting. I had to pivot. I had to pivot from cherry picking every single item myself on the thrift route and at the flea market to now networking and finding inventory in places that were still open when everything else was shut down. So what places were still open? The rag houses were still open. They didn't really close. So I started networking, started sourcing from rag houses, and that's where my business kind of evolved to what most of you guys see today. Most of you guys know me from a very large store. My average sale price was $24.77. My average cost of goods was $4. And this was prepped, washed, and delivered $4 per piece. Now, this was items that would sell for as low as $9.99, $12. And this was items that I would sell at my brick and mortar store for up to $1,000 or up on eBay for $1,000 or more, but at an average cost of $4 per piece and an average sale price of $24.77, I wanted to build a machine that would list $250 and sell $250 every single day. And I knew from the beginning that I would need a 50,000 item store. So we worked every single day. We got the store up to the proper level. We were very profitable the entire way because if you are spending $4 per piece, you list $250, you are at $1,000 cost of goods. And when you sell, you know, $100, $150 a day, there's still plenty of margin left when there's a $24, $25 average sale price. So the idea of it's okay not to be profitable because I'm scaling when it comes to reselling, I do not subscribe to that at all. We are not running businesses where our profit margin is like Walmart, 1% or 2%. We are running businesses where our profit margin is 200% ROI. We've all sold items that we've got from a dollar for $100. And if you cannot scale properly, profitably, then you are doing it incorrect and you are moving too fast. As far as I'm concerned, I've been playing with house money since the very first item that I sold. I bought a T-Mobile Sidekick on Craigslist. I sold it on eBay for $70. In my mind at the time, I doubled my money. I didn't have a true fundamental understanding of how fees work. In my mind, I doubled my money, 35 to 70. 
So I went back onto Craigslist and I bought two more. I sold those two for 140. So I'm, you know, net positive $70. And then I went out and bought three and saved my $35. And I just kept doing that. I just kept taking the same original principle, putting it back into new inventory and anything that was on top, I scraped over into my bank account. So even at the highest level of my business, $4 per piece cost of goods, 250 items a day, I had to spend $1,000 on cost of goods every single day for that business. But I was selling six, seven, eight thousand dollars $8,000 a day worth of, worth of merchandise on eBay. After fees, after overhead and expenses, I was still way in the clear, which allowed me to do what? That $1,000 that I had to buy those 250 items I'm selling 250 items for five, six, seven, eight thousand dollars a day sometimes. I get my original principal back. I'm taking my original principal and buying 250 more items and just scraping everything else off the top to the bank account. And in order to do this, you have to have good money management and you have to be disciplined. And this is what we talked about a lot in the podcast with Henley. We have to be able to control our sell through which means we cannot pick up bad items, we cannot make bad listings, and we cannot have bad prices. We have to make quality listings. How do you make a quality listing? It's every single thing that we talk about in the Facebook group. Every single thing matters. And for the people in the group, I cannot tell you how many people have only been in the group for a couple of weeks and how many posts there have been Oh, I did this to the listing and now it's sold. I did this to that listing and now it's sold. Why isn't this listing selling? Get the advice. Boom, it's sold. And my response always is, it's funny how that works. It's funny how it works when you do the right thing. If you do the right thing on eBay, you know who your customer is. You know what eBay wants. You can sell items. So sell through rate bad items, bad listings, bad prices. If you are not being profitable, then there's not enough margin. So, you know, sometimes people say, well, I want to triple my money. Well, tripling a dollar only gives you $3. It's not enough working capital. We have to have enough margin inside of our items where we can sell an item, get our original principal back, and then replace the item and save money in our bank account. Sell an item get our original principal back, go out and buy two more items. So replace it and buy another one, grow mode, and still have money in the bank. So just as an example, just for round numbers, if you bought an item for $5, you sold it for $25, five goes to shipping, and now you have $20 that comes back to you. You have your original principal. You can go out and get another opportunity with another item. You have $15 left. You can go out and get an additional item, grow your store, grow mode, because you're replacing every sale with two items, and you still have $10 to pay yourself. You still have $10 to pay your bills. If you want to go in extreme grow mode, you can take your original principal, replace the item. You can go out and buy two more, and you still have $5 left for yourself to put into your bank account. Because we have our business that we run, and we also have our personal businesses. And there are a lot of people who maybe run a profitable business, but their business as a human being is not profitable. So their expenses are too high personally, mortgage, going to Sizzler, obligations, and they're always back to zero as a person. And their business doesn't produce enough income to let them save and let them get ahead. So it's it's kind of like, you know, Friday to Friday, check to check reselling. So we have to figure out ways where we can bring our expenses down and we could do this on the reselling side or we have to find ways where we can bring our expenses down and we can do this on the personal side. So on the reselling side, how do we bring our expenses down? Because that there's only two ways to make more money. Only two ways. One, sell more items. Two, bring your expenses down while your sale price stays the same. So how can we bring our expenses down? We can go to places where items are cheaper. We don't have to go to the thrift store. 
We can go to flea markets. We can go to garage sales. We can buy locally. We can go to different thrift stores. We can go on sale price. We can gain the brand knowledge and gain the education. So that way, when we do see an item that is underpriced, that is a great item, we don't pass it because we're naive. So in the video a couple of weeks ago where I showed you guys how to get Disney annual passes for free, because I knew the brand, I was able to bring my cost down. So bringing your cost down doesn't mean your average sale price comes down. Bringing your cost down, your average sale price has to be the same because we're trying to increase our margin. So at this particular thrift, they had Peter Millar's for $12.99. $9.99, $15.99. They knew the brand Peter Millar. Fine, no problem. But they didn't know the brand Roan. And they had those priced at $5.99, $7.99. And that brand sells great. That brand sells better than Peter Millar. But they didn't know that brand. So I was able to keep my average sale price the same and or raise it while bringing my expenses down on my, on my inventory because I was able to identify a brand they didn't know and buy that one for cheaper. Now, maybe they figure it out down the line, no problem, but we have to continuously educate ourselves and continuous, be, continuously be ahead of the curve. And that is going to be another reoccurring topic in this podcast as well. So our sell-through, our bad items, bad listings, bad prices, not enough margin. The number three death blow to most businesses is they are not disciplined enough to not overspend. They have a 10 a day listing habit and they're out there buying 20 a day, seven days a week. That is overspending, that lacks discipline. They buy a bunch of stuff, cherry pick out of their own items, list what they wanna list and then disregard the other stuff. We have money, we have capital, we have money locked up into items that are not listed on eBay. And last time I checked, Nobody has ever knocked on any of our doors and asked to buy our unlisted inventory. So if you have a thousand items that are unlisted and you paid $8 each, that's $8,000 of your business's money sitting over there in the corner without ever having an option to sell. So we don't go to Walmart and ask to shop from the back room. We shop with what's on the floor. eBay shoppers don't go to eBay and then go to your house and ask what's behind there what else can I buy? They just don't do that. So, you know, all of these things we have discussed at length already in the group. And these are the conversations that we talk about every single day, all day. And the improvements that we are making already have been absolutely amazing. And I cannot be happier. And I think the the most amazing thing is, you know, people are posting their workspaces and some of them, these are not my words. Some of them are tornadoes. Some of them are disasters. But in just such small amounts of time, the absolute transformation between total disaster and a very beautiful, inviting workspace that can be, you know, provide such a consistent environment has been absolutely mind blowing for me. And the amount of pep in the step, you know, the, the amount of excitement, it has really blossomed into such a beautiful place, such a beautiful culture in such a short amount of time. And for the people that are in the podcast here, I'm going to host a call just for you guys every couple of weeks. Q&A style, you guys can ask me anything you want because I do want to continue and add more value every single month and never change anything outside of that. So, you know, for the, for the Facebook group and all the coaching calls and all the resources and every single thing that we offer, $1 a day, that separates drama from being committed, having a little bit of skin in the game. It's worth much more by everybody's account, but it's $1. If you cannot replace the $1 and be profitable on your $1 investment, you can contact me and I will give you a 100% full refund. And I will continue to add even more value to the group as the group grows and the price will never raise. It has never raised and will never raise. For the four ninety nine tier, podcast tier, you guys didn't know this when you signed up, but 
every couple of weeks, I'm going to do a call with you guys, just us, small group. And we're going to get in there and we're going to problem solve. We're going to do Q and a, and I'm here for anything you guys need. So, you know, I guess in addition to the group starting, um, you know, a couple other things, as you guys know, I launched the YouTube channel. I'm having a lot of fun with that, making a lot of cool videos. And I think this past weekend when I released this video at a flea market I've never been to four hours away, I think that I finally like discovered my mission on YouTube. And I just want to continuously prove that everybody can do this. And the separator is the experience and the knowledge. When I was brand new, again, we have this in common. I didn't know everything that I know today. I have 15 years doing this every single day, all day, for most part, 20 hours a day. This is what I have lived and breathed for 15 years every single day, all day. Best dad, best husband, best eBay. That's it. And so that that's why I can go anywhere and I can leave with thousands of dollars worth of merchandise. So I've been to a flea market in a town with less than 3,000 people. I found ten dollars to $20,000 worth of stuff in a very small flea market with about 20 people there. I went to a thrift to three thrift stores I've never been to four hours from my house, pulled out three or four thousand dollars worth of profit in two hours or so. I went to that flea market in the video this weekend. Never been there. Two hours, four thousand dollars worth of profit and also made a connection with somebody who, if I had continued to go to that flea market, they would probably no doubt in my mind be able to, to supply me a thousand pieces of inventory per month. And just take notes that the knowledge is the key. The the education and the brand research every single day, studying solds, doing deep dives is the key. And just to reinforce that, I did the video of 500 bolos. Nothing was written down. I literally walked around all the Disney parks and called out 500 obscure bolos. Like, there's a smashed pumpkin. Did you know about smashing pumpkin? You know, Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness shirts. Those shirts sell for a lot of money. Did you know this cat over here? Did you know that Vintage Ninja Turtles Scratch the Cat sells for a lot of money? Hey, wait, there's a dog right next to it. Did you know that Ninja Turtles Hot Spot, that dog sells for a tremendous amount of money? All of these things like combined together makes it certain that you never blank when you're at the thrift store. And I sympathize with people who are new I sympathize with people whose, you know, sourcing is difficult, but we need more knowledge. We need more brand research. eBay has changed. It will always change. It always evolves. And it's 2023, about to be 2024. We are not relegated to what we have in our immediate area. There is a guy in the group. He is the number one seller of video games on Amazon. He is the number one seller of video games on eBay millions of dollars and he lives in a town that does not have a stoplight they do not have a stop sign he gets all of his items all of his inventory sourced online it is 2023 we are not relegated to what's in our area what's down the street if you have the knowledge you take time to educate yourself we live in the most abundant company country in the world and these items are out there and we can go find them so you know, as I was talking about earlier, I love every single thing about reselling. I love taking nothing and turning it into money. That is probably my most favorite thing in the world is taking something and turning it into money, whether it be a hat at the flea market, whether it be a hat that I found in the street. Um, I've done that time or two, whether it be finding stuff in the garbage. I know it's worth money. I take it out. I prep it. I list it. I sell it on eBay. We did that a couple of months ago. Um, we were out for our morning walk, my wife and I, and I saw a Cabbage Patch doll on the top of a trash bag. And it was a vintage one. On the back, it said Xavier Roberts. And I knew, bing, you know, that's a vintage one. I could sell this. I knew that was a $20 bill just sitting right on top of the trash can. I opened up the bag 
and there was hundreds and hundreds of vintage Playmore, Playmobil toy figures. So I ran home, got the car, grabbed the bag, took one group photo of the Playmobil. That's not my business. So I don't need to take time and study all of the characters and all the product lines and figure out, am I going to get caught slipping on one rare figure? My cost of goods is zero. So took one photo, put the Playmobil for auction, sold it for $102.50 in one week, made $80 or so after all expenses, $80 out of thin air, made $20 on the Cabbage Patch doll, and also inside of the garbage bag was a uh, a slight toy. Probably made close to $150 out of thin air. And that is my most favorite thing in the world. My most favorite thing in the world is to make money out of thin air. And eBay allows us to do that. Reselling allows us to do that. Thrift stores allow us to do that. Everything that we do allow us to do that. So, you know, saying that eBay changes. eBay has changed probably a hundred times in my reselling career of the last 15 years. Most of the time, eBay changes for good. And I think that they always mean well. Whether they mean well by us, most of the time, 110% they do. They're only trying to make the platform better. They're only trying to help us sell more items because that is their business. The more items they sell, the more money they make. It's a very interesting concept. So they have nothing against us. We're not in punishment. They are actively trying to recruit customers, find customers, send them our direction, and they want those customers to convert on our items so that it results in a sale. It is a very simple business model. And unless we have good items, unless we can present them the proper way, if we have an enticing return policy, if our item specifics match the, the title and the description, and there's no confusing, if the photos are good, if our feedback is good, if we present ourselves in a good way where eBay can trust us to sell this item where it is not going to result in a return request or in negative feedback, eBay will have confidence to send us the traffic. If they do not have confidence to send us the traffic, meaning when buyers do see our items, they look and leave, then they don't have confidence in us. So why would you present those items in a buyer that eBay had to buy? eBay buys the buyer because they have to spend ad money to buy the buyer. So they are purchasing the buyer and sending the buyer to us where they will have confidence that that buyer will complete the transaction, therefore eBay receiving the final value fee. eBay doesn't care if we're profitable on the item. eBay, their business, they want to receive the final value fee. That's where they make their money. So what we have seen throughout the years, you know, it started off envelopes in the mail, concealed cash. You have to go to CVS and scan your photos and upload them. No categories on eBay, just listed in the abyss and hopefully somebody finds it. And, you know, they've made a ton of changes. They linked up with PayPal so we could do electronic payments. They have made categories where everything is easier to find. They have set up the resolution center because before that it was just you and the buyer fighting in messages with nobody taking control. It was a very messy situation. They have, you know, implemented all of these things that we have today. We have digital cameras. We have access to therapy. We have access to much more data. We have access to promotions. We didn't always have that. And now all the new stuff, we have access to buyer groups, newsletters, promoted listings, offers to watchers, coupons. All of this stuff is very, very new. And eBay has changed sometimes where it's very difficult. eBay has changed sometimes where it's not as difficult. One of the most difficult times of my eBay career was when eBay started to institute the DSRs, the detailed seller ratings. And that's based on your shipping, based on your communication. And those are the star ratings on our feedback. There was a time where if you received a three-star rank or lower, you would get a defect for that. 
And if your defect went above 3%, there were people losing their account on detailed seller rating reports. Luckily, eBay has walked back that approach. And now we don't have to worry about that as much. eBay sometimes is very lenient about removing feedback. eBay sometimes is not lenient about removing feedback. During the DSR days, and if you were around back then, you would know it was almost impossible to have a negative feedback removed outside of the customers saying, if you do not do this, I will leave you negative feedback. If they said any other verbiage outside of that, eBay was not removing it. And then we went into what most people are accustomed to now, where um, if you have 60 day returns, the buyer returns it. You try to work with the customer. You try to do the right thing. eBay was willing to help us and remove the negative feedback, which I was in favor of that because if we are offering the most aggressive return policy that eBay has to offer and we reach out to the customer to try to fix any sort of issue, we should get some kind of credit for that because if they're not going to help us on our reputation of trying to do the right thing and work the, work it out with the customer and offering the most aggressive return policy, free return, 60-day free returns, what incentive is there going to be for offering free returns? One of the biggest incentives to me was the feedback protection, my reputation protection, because sometimes I sell items and I disclose all the flaws, the buyer doesn't read it, and they leave a negative feedback that says it has no flaws. But or they, they leave a negative feedback that says this item has flaws when I advertise it to have flaws. So now it's more of a struggle. And that's okay. That's okay. It's eBay's business. It's their sandbox. We live, we, we live in it. It's their company. We have to abide by the rules. And we always have to pivot. We always have to do better. And we always have to figure out the best way with the rules to the game as eBay sets them forward. And if you know the rules to the game, you can win the game. If you're playing Monopoly and you are a casual player and you play versus a professional Monopoly player, you do not stand a chance. There is a lot of casual eBay players where all they have to do is read the rules, read the terms of service, read the regulations that eBay offers, and abide by the rules. Because just like eBay has buyer protection, eBay also has seller protection. And every single time where I've had an issue where it does come to seller protection, and it hasn't been a lot, hand, handful of times and hundreds of thousands of items sold, eBay has always had my back. And if you do the right thing on eBay, eBay will always help you. I can never say anything outside of that. They will always help you if you do the right thing. So, but things change. And that's what we're talking about here, the change. I mean, it's gotten much more competitive. Amazon is here now. The markets have evolved. Um, you used to be able to set it and forget it. But now we have to be competitive. We have to be better. Better how? Better products. Better listings. Better quality. Better business rules. Better business principles. Every single thing that we work on in the group, we have to continue to get better. There's more shoppers, but the buyers are more savvy. The buyers have more opportunities to shop. So eBay requires change. And a lot of times we make the example of, you know, oh, these dinosaur eBay resellers never evolve with the times and that's why they are not succeeding. But if we do not evolve, we will also turn into those dinosaurs. So the way how eBay was done five years ago, you cannot find success in how eBay needs to be done now. The way eBay was done 10 years ago, you don't stand a chance. Things have changed. They have changed big time. So we need to evolve. And these things that eBay is implementing, it allows them to make more profit, make more revenue without acquiring any new buyers or selling any more items, which is fine. I'm on board with it. I run businesses, I understand. Their sole focus, just like our sole focus and every other business's sole focus is to drive revenue and drive profit. And I'm all for it. 
They have to do what they have to do. We have to do what we have to do. And if you look at the, the earnings and you look at the reports, in addition to promoted listings, in addition to markdowns, in addition to coupon, in addition to buyer group, in addition to all of that stuff, they have been leaning heavily into promoted listings. And promoted listings last quarter was over $340 million worth of revenue, which was up almost 40%. That is a way for this company to make more revenue, make more profit without acquiring new buyers and without selling more items. And it is a brilliant strategy, brilliant strategy. And that's the reality. We cannot fight that. We cannot change that. But what we can do is adapt. And what we could do is get better. We have to be ahead of the curve. Otherwise, we will get left behind. And if you are doing all the stuff that we talk about, because I try to be many years ahead, we will not get left behind. It is not eBay's fault our items are not selling. Our items require eyeballs to get sold. And if we do not have eyeballs, our items will not sell. Sometimes the search changes. So if you are copying other people's listings, you are learning how to do data entry. You are not learning how to do eBay. We must learn how to do eBay. Otherwise, we are doing data entry and you do not know what to do when things change. Things are changing. That's business. That's life. No business that you're going to start is a guarantee. If you want a guarantee, you're probably better off getting a nine to five job that has a steady paycheck. eBay is a contact sport. eBay is a proactive sport. Reselling is contact. Reselling is proactive. If eBay wants to lean on promoted listings to make revenue, it's fine by me. We have to learn how to evolve and get better and succeed in that business model. No problem. So there's a couple of things on the horizon, and I think these are three, four, five years out. We don't have to make any changes today, but we do need to think about these things. With the promoted listings, there's a few different ways that eBay offers promoted listings. One is to promote your listing, which increases search placement. Increased search placement means more eyeballs. And something that I learned very early on in my brick and mortar store was when people walk in the door, I make a lot of money and do fine. But if it's raining and nobody walks in the door, then I don't do as well. So when people come in, great. When no one comes, not as great. So promoted listings guarantees placement. Placement guarantees eyeballs. There's a couple different ways that you can run promoted listings. You could do the one that increases your search placement in search. They have promoted listings advanced, which is the pay-per-click op option where you bid on a keyword. For example, Miami Marlins, you could bid 50 cents. So every single time someone types in Miami Marlins, they will assess you a 50 cent fee. Promoted listing standard, the fee only comes out when the buyer purchases the item through the promoted listings link in the promoted listing search result. It has no impact on organic search results. They also have new ones now, newer ones where you can promote externally. They have where you can promote your entire store with a store banner. And for some of these things, they are fantastic tools, depending on whatever your business model is. If your business model is replenishable one-off items, Maybe the pay-per-click is not the best option. If you sell a widget like iPhone cables, maybe pay-per-click is a fantastic option and you're blowing it out of the water. No problem. So for the focus of this discussion, we're going to focus on the promoted listing standard. And there are a couple of ways to run the campaigns. One of the ways is to do a static percent that never changes. And one of the ways is to do a dynamic percent that changes based on the market. 
the static percent, and this is the one that I do because I want to know how profitable my items are when they do sell. I don't want to guess or do a bunch of additional things to know how profitable that item was. And when you do the sliding scale, it could have sold at 2%. It could have sold at 20%. And you don't have a real grasp on how profitable your item was when it sells when you do have that sliding scale. So for me personally, I do the static rate that always stays the same. And I have gone over to the eBay sales calculator, where if you go in the Google machine and type in eBay sales calculator, you can run all of your numbers and you can see even if you can afford promoted listings, because there are a lot of people running promoted listings with A, a number that they pulled out of thin air or heard somewhere else and cannot afford, or are running promoted listings at a, such a high rate that they cannot afford to even run promoted listings. So I would go over to the Google machine and I would see what you can actually afford if you can. So the second option is the sliding scale. There's two different ways to do this. They have a dynamic that goes based on what the market is. And then they also have a dynamic that goes based on what the market is, but has a cap that you can implement. So let's say you want to choose dynamic and you want to put a cap at 5%. If the market goes to 7 eBay is going to cap your promoted listings at 5 You will never go above 5 That is the cap of as much extra promoted listings fees that they will allow you to run. And that is one way of doing it. However, that is not the default way of doing it. The default way of running promoted listings, if you've run a campaign, is dynamic based on the market. What is the issue with a dynamic promoted listings campaign based on the market? Is that it's based on the market. If you have sold on Amazon, you are familiar with what a repricer is. A repricer on Amazon is the race to the bottom. If I have something at $19.99, you come in with your repricer, you go $19.98. Since Amazon has a buy box, you get all the sales. I will never get a sale until I go to $19.97. And now this guy went from selling a bunch to selling none. Now he goes to $19.96. I go to $19.95, $19.94, all the way down to one penny. And no one's profitable because the repricer has done a race to the bottom. If you have paid attention to promoted listings or if you have been running campaigns, you will know when they first started this, recommended was pretty low, 2 3 4 5% additional fees. Now promoted listings is recommended 15 18 20 20 plus for certain categories that may be saturated. And this dynamic promoted listings is an automatic opposite repricer. So if a bunch of people are doing dynamic automatic promoted listings and it's at 15, in order to beat the 15, what do we got to do? We got to go to 16. Once the market catches up and everyone's at 16, what do we have to do? We have to go to 17. Once the market catches up, we go to 18, 19, 20. 21, 22, so on and so forth. So there may come a day, again, three, four, five years down the line, where the recommended promoted listing might be in the 30s, 40s, 50%. And this is a brilliant move on eBay's part to drive revenue. And again, eBay's is a business. They sole focus and sole responsibility is to drive revenue and drive profits for their shareholders. That is their job. That is their duty. That is their obligation. I have zero issue with that. We have to figure out how to evolve with the ever-changing landscape of reselling. That is our job. That is our duty. Maybe eBay implements something where it doesn't get out of control like that. Maybe they don't. Time will tell. But I am not going to wait for that. If I was going to develop a strategy for the next three, four, or five years, I think that there is only three ways to succeed in eBay going forward for the next three, four, five years down the line. We're talking 26, 27, 28, the year 2030. There's three ways to do it. You will either need to accept the fact that you will have a lower margin 
because you are going to keep getting the same items. And instead of promoting them at 8% or 10%, now those items need to be promoted at 20 or 25%. So you are going to accept a lower margin, which means that you have to sell more items to make the same money. And that's fine. You can run that business. Great news. You can run that business. You can run the business of lower margin, more volume. Lower margin, low, low volume doesn't work. But lower margin, more volume, you can build a beautiful business around that business model. And there's nothing wrong with that. And you can find success doing that model. Lower margin, higher volume. Or you could do same margin, larger store. Because what's going to happen? If we want to continue to price our items up to where we can absorb the promoted listings cost of maybe an extra 10%, maybe an extra 15 or 20%, we still want to you know, keep our items there so we have enough margin to play with so that way we can still remain profitable. That's okay too. It's just going to come with the understanding that our items are going to sell through much slower. And if they're going to sell through much slower, our inventory is going to be much larger. So maybe we had a 1,000 item store that gave us X amount of sales per day due to the products that we were putting in and how we were pricing them. Maybe we need a 5,000 item store that is still going to give us a 1,000 item store result of today. That is very possible. If you have a 10,000 item store, maybe you're going to need a 30,000 item store to give you the results of what a 10,000 item store is today if you want to keep your price in a range where you can still absorb the promoted listings, and still make a profit, aka you're going to price your items higher, you're going to wait a little longer. And that business model works too. There's nothing wrong with that model. Nothing wrong with pricing here, but accepting the fact that I'm going to have a larger inventory. That's okay too. You could build a beautiful business model on top of that as well. What you would have to do is sell items and outpace your overhead of a larger facility and perhaps even more help since the infrastructure has grown. The number three way to do it is to source and identify better items that do not need promoted listings. And we all have that option today too. So of course, that one sounds the easiest, but that one may be the most difficult because there are tons of brands out there that sell fine and do not need promoted listings. C.C. Filson, great brand, very profitable, tremendous sell-through, but point us all in the direction of truckload of C.C. Filson, very difficult. There are items inside of certain brands. Polo Ralph Lauren has 330,000 active and you know 80,000 sold. So that, that's like a one-year sell-through. There are items inside of Polo Ralph Lauren that are readily available that if you use the right keywords, those have over a 100% sell through. One of them is, last time I checked, was the red and black big pony. It says Spain across the front. Um, last time I checked, there was 80 something active and there was 120 something sold. That is a 150% sell through. So we need to identify these items that have a faster sell through and don't need promoted listings. That is the third option. So lower margin, higher volume, that works. That works today, that works tomorrow, that will work in the history of time, in the future, past and present. That model works. Walmart does a tremendous job. Slower sell through, larger inventory. That model works too. Just requires more overhead and a larger space more expenses. That model works just fine as well. Better items that don't require promoted listings, that model will always work as well. It just requires a bunch of effort, a bunch of education, a bunch of resources, and a bunch of sourcing. That works too. So, you know, all of this is many years away. And what can we do to make sure that we are in the proper position where we can find these items and we can continue to build our business in a profitable and productive manner. And all of these things is what we talk about in the group. And nothing that I talk about in the group is anything except for this. The advice that I give in the group is never slower sales, less results. The advice we talk about is more sales, more results. 
better bank account. I never come on here and give you the opposite. So we need to figure out where we can fit in best. And like I said, we don't have to do anything now. This, this is not a now problem. This is just something that we need to think about going forward for the health and safety of our business. And maybe we don't go forward. Maybe some people get their money, they get in and they get out. That's fine too. But we need to figure out where exactly we are going to get in, where we are going to fit in. And if we get out, what what are we going to do after that? So I think for the lower margin, higher volume, if I was to pick one of these models for me, that is probably the model that I would lean on the most because I am not afraid to list. I am not afraid to do more work. I am not afraid to ship more. That to me, I believe is the easiest one because that amount of inventory is abundant in many, many different places. It's abundant everywhere. You are going to do more listing. You are going to do more photography. You're going to ship more. However, sourcing is going to be way, way easier. Um, the next one is the slower sell-through, higher expenses model. That one is difficult to do because it's always hard to run a business where you are trying to stay one step ahead of your expenses or trying to always stay ahead of all of your costs. So I believe that one can be done, however, not done by all, perhaps, because if you are in a metropolitan area, it's going to be very, very expensive. Your overhead for your building, your warehouse, your storage is going to be expensive. And also your labor is going to be expensive because when you have such a huge business, you're going to need help just due to the dynamics of length. Like for me in my warehouse, I have over one mile of racks. If you put them all in a straight line, it's over one mile, but they're stacked on top of four. So it, it's in reality, it's a quarter of a mile of racks, but it's one mile of racks that we have to look through and search through. And just due to the length, I needed to hire people to help me do that portion of the business. So with that, the more cost, more overhead, all of that runs a bunch of risks where if one thing goes wrong, it becomes very, very difficult to continue to succeed. And you also have to keep in mind, once you start renting, once you start hiring employees, if you have to sign a commercial lease or if you have to sign a lease for a storage unit, those costs are not fixed. Those costs go up all the time. And when I first got my brick and mortar store, I think my rent was like $2,900. It's $4,000 now and it's only been five or six years. It just keeps going up 5%, 5%, 5%, 3%, 3% on top of 3%, on top of 3%, on top of 3%. So like it is a humongous snowball to pay any kind of rent. And if you have employees, employees want raises. You know, if if you're doing the right thing and you're doing W-2, you're getting hit for, you know, EFTPS and all of that kind of stuff, Medicare, withholdings, like all of that stuff costs money. And we have to be able to sell enough items to outpace all of these expenses that are always going to expand. So I think that the lower margin if you can identify stuff that is very fast sell through everyday value items, you can always kind of crank that wheel and sell more items. If you have a larger facility and your business is built on and based on, I need to get more of all the money in order to afford this. That's a much more scarier place to be in my opinion. Um, but I think for most people who, and from the thousands of people that I've talked to, most people are not trying to build a humongous eBay empire. And a humongous eBay empire comes with a large warehouse, comes with employees. Not everybody wants that. Most people don't. And that's fine. No problem. Most people don't want hundreds of items to list and hundreds of items to ship, hundreds of items to source. That's okay, too. The best model for most people going forward in the next three, four, five, six, seven years is going to be 
identifying better items that sell through faster that are going to give you a proper profit margin with promoted listings enabled and with promoted listings not enabled. So there's two different paths that you can go down when it comes to this. You can identify products that sell through fast enough where they do not need promoted listings, meaning they're not highly saturated, meaning there's not a lot of competition, meaning that you know the proper keywords. Because here's something very interesting. When we talk about sell-through, every single item on eBay has a 100% sell-through at a certain price point. This shirt that I'm wearing, unbranded, at 99 cents, will sell through within 90 days. This hat, at a certain price, at $7, will sell through within 90 days. But can we afford to get to that point where it will sell through in 90 days? And in most cases, it's no. So we can identify products that sell through in a fast enough time where we don't need to pay promoted listings. We don't need to pay eBay additionally. We don't need to pay eBay additional to bring us a customer to find them because customers are already looking for these items. That is an option. Or we can find better items that are going to have a higher average sale price where we can afford to promote them and still make up the difference while these items are going to sell through fast enough for us. So we need to fight this battle on two fronts for most people. Front number one, education, research, knowledge. Front number one. Front number two, sell through. We need to be identifying items that are going to sell through fast enough where we do not have to be paying an exorbitant amount of fees in promoted listings. If we're able to do that, we will be able to live beautiful, beautiful eBay lives. And as I said, eBay has changed hundreds of times in my life. DSRs was the most difficult portion. But I think that with expenses going up everywhere. And, and let's not take it for granted. eBay's expenses have gone up. Their labor has gone up. Their property taxes, have everything for eBay has gone up. Their electricity, all of that stuff has gone up and they need to recoup this. They are running a business. It is their right. It is, it is all within their right and they are doing everything that they're supposed to do. As long as they are driving profit, driving revenue, and they have a bunch of money in the bank, hats off, good on them. That's their job. So do not, under any circumstance, take this as being critical, because I'm not. I'm a, I'm a businessman. I know how business works. They are doing what they are supposed to do. We have to be reactionary and proactive and do what we have to do. And if we do one of these three models, it doesn't have to be today. Right now, today, we are still in the golden age of reselling. There's still plenty of money to go around. But we have to think about this stuff has to be in the back of our mind that this golden age of reselling will not last forever. And we have this opportunity. And since we have this opportunity, it is our responsibility to take advantage fully of the responsibility that, that we have. Otherwise, we are doing a disservice and we are not living up to our potential. So every single day, we need to get our work done. We need to do what we say we need to run the businesses that we say we run. If you do that, if you put in what eBay requires, eBay has always taken care of me. And things change, and that's life. We have to change. We have to roll with the punches, and we have to get better. Once upon a time, you can list it and forget it. Right now, Quality listings will get you through. In three, four, or five years, a quality listing might not be good enough to run a profitable eBay business. So I hope you found this podcast helpful. If you have any questions, please drop them down below. I am eternally thankful for everything that eBay has given me and the opportunity of reselling that has given my family. And I could not be more proud of 
what I've accomplished and what everybody else has accomplished in the group. And I sincerely appreciate everybody for listening. And I just want the best for everybody. And start thinking about these things. Think about the roadmaps. Think about what's coming up. We need to live in the now, but we need to think about the future. So thank you for tuning in. Thank you to everybody who has joined the group. I will not let you down. I promise you that. And thank you to everybody who watches the videos. I hope that the underlying reoccurring thoughts that come into your head after watching the video is that knowledge is truly key and knowledge is what is going to separate us from everybody else. So with that said, think about this stuff. It's an interesting discussion to have. And until next time, be great.